Good morning and welcome to our worship on this the second Sunday of Bible Month that we're celebrating here at Southgate. This year, Bible Month takes the form of looking at the Old Testament book of Ruth. Last week we looked at chapter 1 and today we're going to look at chapter 2. But before we get that far, let's share together in a call to worship. I've chosen some words from Psalm 146. Words that actually will have relevance to what we're going to look at later on in the book of Ruth. And so the psalmist writes, The Lord watches over foreigners and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. And so we join together in our first hymn. Come, let us all unite and sing, God is love. And so we come to God to offer him our prayers of adoration and our prayers of confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you in our various homes, drawn by the power of your matchless love. We come with different concerns, different pleasures, but we come united in one to offer you the worship that you deserve. We come so that we can open our hearts and minds. We come so that we can derive strength to live for the coming week. But above all, we come to praise you for all that you have done for us in the past, and all that you will do with us in the future. So, loving God, hear these, our praise. But we also come and make confession. God of all mercy, we don't live as you would have us live. We don't always follow the path of discipleship. All too often we are led astray. We look after ourselves, but we don't look after others. We don't see the weak and powerless in our midst for concern with our own affairs. We don't support those who need our support. 
we divide ourselves up into us and them and we are reluctant to let anybody into our circle who does not conform to our pattern of living Father God forgive us open our eyes to see everybody as loved and cherished by you and help us in the future to respect and be open to all and we offer these prayers of adoration and confession in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord Amen well, as I said at the start of this uh, web service we're in Bible month here at Southgate Last week we looked at uh, Ruth chapter 1 and today we're going to be concentra concentrating on Ruth chapter 2. And so we're going to hear read most of Ruth chapter 2. I've just chopped a few verses off at the end for the, for the benefit of time. So Ruth chapter 2 introduces us to the character of Boaz who is the, the focus for our thoughts this week. So we start reading in chapter 2 at verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Emelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind any one in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered the field, and began to glean the harvest. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Emelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of the harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Ruth said, Please let me glean and garner among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here. Have some bread and dip in this wine with vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her even pull out some stalks for her from one of the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about epiphath. 
she carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she'd left over after she had eaten enough. So, so ends our reading from the Old Testament. Thanks be to God for his word. And so let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be accepted in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> and so we come in our Bible month to Ruth chapter 2. So, so far, what do we know? Well, let's have a little bit of background information to start with. The story of the book of Ruth probably was written sometime between 1380 and 1050 BC. Initially, it would be passed down through the oral tradition before finally being committed to paper, possibly by an unnamed author. Ruth recounts the private and domestic affairs of a family from Bethlehem who leave to find refuge in Moab. Naomi and her husband Elamech and their two sons Marlon and Kilon. And for those of you who like a little bit of trivia, the two sons' names translate from Hebrew as sickly and wasting away. The Hebrew names are probably better. In chapter 1, which Ailey brought to us last week, we discover that Elimelech and the two sons die. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law are left struggling in a strange land without food. Eventually they decide to return to Bethlehem. But Opera, one of the daughter-in-laws, after much heart-searching, decides that she cannot return with her mother-in-law and makes the choice to stay in Moab. But Ruth, despite being asked, will not leave her mother-in-law Naomi and makes the difficult decision to go with her back to Bethlehem and make a new life there. So we have this tragic picture of these two widows, one old and one young, returning to Bethlehem to make a fresh start. And so that was the basis of what we looked at last week. Now this week, chapter 2. And in particular, we're going to look at the character of Boaz. Now, the chapter actually begins with an introduction to the man named Boaz. And straight away we're told he was important because of who he came from and his lineage. We know that he is now a relative through marriage of Naomi. Ruth went to find work in the field, and she found work in Boaz's vineyard. In verse 4 we find out that Boaz asks about her, and his workers give him the information. They give him the gossip, tell him all about her. Boaz was impressed, and begins to show her favourable treatment. Boaz tells Ruth to work in his field, and nobody else's and drink water without worry. Now Ruth was surprised at this gesture, especially because she was, after all, a stranger. Boaz tells her that he is aware of her story, how she left her parents in the land of her birth to stay with Naomi. The Lord will repay you, Boaz tells Ruth. Her kindness to her mother-in-law is what has impressed Boaz. So at the end of the story we find Ruth returning home with plenty of food after her day of work. Not only has she enough for her own needs, she has enough for Naomi. And this is a cause of surprise. Ruth then tries to explain and tells Naomi about Boaz. But Naomi knows that God was in the midst of the blessing and that God is comforting them both through the work of Boaz, who is a kinsman. So that's the basis of what we read in chapter 2. Now we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail than that, and look particularly at that central character of Boaz. 
Now, not surprisingly, I want to pull out three things from that chapter that reveal so much about him. Now, we haven't time to do all three properly, so I'm going to do two of them uh, properly and talk about them. And I'm going to mention a third factor very briefly and leave you to do some thinking and to do some work on it. So, this chapter reveals a lot about Boaz, and we're going to find more about Boaz as we go through the rest of Ruth. And I'm going to ask what the character of Boaz can teach us today. Indeed, can the character of Boaz teach us something today? After all, we now live in a postmodernist era. The world of the Old Testament seems a million miles away from life as we know it today. And yet, if you stay with me, I still think it teaches valuable lessons which we need to heed. So the first thing I want to talk about Boaz is to say that he was colour blind. Now this in no way is a reference to his eyesight, because clearly we don't actually know that. But let me explain exactly what I mean by that. One of the best films that has come out in the last few years was the biographical film about Queen Victoria called Victoria and Abdul. The story of how Victoria actually formed a very close friendship with an Indian gentleman called Abdul Karim who became, as she called him, her munshi, her servant. And despite the fact that the establishment of her family and the royal household looked down on this servant, because he was not white and because he was not English, it made no difference to Victoria. Indeed, in A.N. Wilson's new biography of Victoria, which came out a few weeks ago, a few years ago rather, he described Victoria as totally colourblind. And it's that that I'm getting at when I'm talking about Boaz. Boaz too is colourblind. We all have defining characteristics. Of course, so would Ruth. But when Boaz asks, whose young woman is this? He wants to know who she is. And she want, he wants to know about the family. He knows about Ruth, even though he's never actually met her until this moment. But interestingly, if you think about Ruth chapter 2, nowhere do we actually get a physical description of her. No emphasis is put in this chapter, on her physical appearance. We don't know her height or her hair colour, or any other part of her physical appearance. What the chapter does is emphasise her character qualities, not her looks. The pictures that I have seen of Ruth, and probably the picture that I have in my mind, and the picture no doubt that you too will have in your mind, will probably see her as a a young woman but we don't actually know that it may well be true but it's not mentioned but as this story unfolds particularly in chapter 2 we'll see that Boaz is attracted by the kind of woman that she was and not by her physical appearance clearly she would have those defining characteristics as I've already mentioned but he wasn't interested it made no difference to him whatever the text in chapter 2 twice mentions Ruth's Moabite background. It stresses that she's an outsider, a stranger, an immigrant, a kind of refugee. Bethlehem at the time was a type of small village where everybody would know each other and probably know each other's business as well. Which meant that they would know all about Ruth. They would know that she was from a different nation. The Moabite language was different enough so that every time she opened her mouth, people would know that she was not from Bethlehem. Those who have been transplanted from one culture to another easily stand out in a small village community. When Ruth volunteered to go and be a gleaner, she was signing up for hours of hard labour. 
From a human standpoint, her prospects were bleak. She and Naomi were both widows at a time and in a place where widowhood put them in desperate situation. As a young woman, she faced danger by following the men into the field. It was perfectly set up for rude treatment and possibly physical abuse. But Boaz told her to stay in the field because he had ordered the young men not to bother her. And in doing so, yet again, he is colourblind. He overlooks her outsider status. He then instructs her to drink from the jars the young men have filled. Now that in itself is actually quite amazing. As a woman, her job might even have been to fill those jars herself. Instead, Boaz says something quite unexpected. Go ahead, drink from the same jar that the men are using. A woman and a foreigner have been asked to use the same jars that the men and the insiders have been asked to use. It was probably the end of civilization as the men knew it. For here was a woman of different culture, different custom, different practice. And all those defining characteristics were being thrown out of the window as far as Boaz was concerned. It made no difference to him. He was colour and culture blind. Of course, as I speak, these words, race and culture and differences, are a very important feature of our news. Very big news headlines. We've had the campaign this last week about, for example, Black Lives Matter. We've had the tearing down of statues. We've had people almost, if you like, trying to draw a veil over the things that have gone on in the past, where we have prejudiced, been prejudiced against people of different race and different colour. So what Boaz is actually telling us here in his treatment of Ruth is a very valuable lesson that comes from several centuries ago. What we can be sure of is that God does not see people's colour. God does not see colour in that all men are loved, treated, respected and valued equally. He doesn't hold different races and different colours to differing moral standards. God loves all shades equally. But that throws down a challenge to us. We are called to emulate Boaz and put into practice the colour blindness and the culture blindness that Boaz shows in Ruth chapter 2. Difficult challenge. The question is, can we as individuals and collectively as a church live up and respond to that challenge. The second thing that I want to say is that Boaz looks after the weak. Now this is the one I haven't time to do properly. So if you like, I'm going to say a few things and leave you to contemplate it. Or use a more familiar phrase to me, I'm going to leave you to do some homework. A widow in a foreign land Somebody of no consequence, and yet he noticed her. He's taken care of her. That's what I want you to look at and see what you see in chapter 2 about Boaz showing the characteristics of looking after the weak. But in particular, what I want to draw attention to comes in verses 11 and 12, where Boaz says to her that she has committed herself to the God of Israel under whose wings you have now come for refuge. What does that tell us about God's commitment to Ruth and Ruth's commitment to the God that she has now come to follow and to serve? And a supplementary question that I want you to consider at some point. Who are the weak outside 
our church walls that we should be supporting. Now, if I had time, I might go a bit further on that, uh, but I'm going to leave you to think about that. I move swiftly on to the final thing that I'm going to say about Boaz. And the third thing is that he feeds the hungry. Methodism, throughout its long and distinguished history, have had a fine reputation for hospitality. For example, not in my days on the preaching plan, but certainly in my younger days when I started preaching, the older preachers who were still alive and around at the time would speak about their receiving of hospitality when on a Sunday they would go and preach to far off chapel and be entertained to lunch and to tea so they could take the services and how families were only too pleased to open their homes to give hospitality to visiting preachers. In many ways it was one of the very good things about Methodist local preaching that they received this hospitality and of course it had the added advantage of building relationships. The Methodist Church, in its social responsibility, has always had a good reputation for the giving of hospitality in its various forms. Hospitality is also deeply embedded in Middle Eastern culture. I suppose you could argue in one sense, Boaz is merely showing kindness to a young woman in need. But if you look at it a little bit deeper, you realise that he is doing something quite remarkable. In this short book, and if you want a bit of trivia, it's only 85 verses. The word Moab, or Moabite, pops up 11 times. Now that is the writer's way of telling us that Ruth is an outsider. And that outside status, I believe, that Ruth has is the key to the whole story. She's a woman, she's a widow, and she's from Moab. But if you want a bit of history, the Jews and the Moabites were bitter enemies. If you go back a little bit further in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy in chapter 23, it offers this blunt warning. No Ammonite or Moabite or descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord God. In other words, don't speak to them. Keep them at arm's length. And that is actually what happened. The people would have nothing to do with the Moabites. Don't live among them. Don't marry them. Don't follow their gods. And for goodness sake, don't invite them to worship with you. Boaz undoubtedly would have been aware of that teaching. And yet, at this moment in our story, Boaz chooses to ignore these warnings. So therefore, it is amazing that he would allow Ruth to drink water alongside his male workers. That, as I've already said, is shocking. But now he goes a stage further. Ruth, he says, you can sit at my table and eat with my men. Find a place and eat all the roasted grain that you want. Now, of course, there's the physical act of eating, but eating together also suggests friendship, support, and of shared values. Now, take that concept and apply it to life in ancient, ancient Israel. The vast majority of men would certainly not have shown such kindness to a Moabite widow. It simply just wouldn't happen. But Boaz had a heart. He saw the need for food. And because he saw the need for food, he crossed that social divide. So he feeds the hungry. In doing so, he breaks the rules. But it didn't really matter. He offers food to the hungry and makes a social stand on it. Now, what does that tell us today? Well, rather than actually give you a few pointers, I'm going to offer you a good news story. 
and it's about a young man called John, who is actually a real man. Uh, John used to come to our food bank here at Southgate. And as I used to do, I always used to give out invitations to the people of the food bank to come to our soup and sandwiches, which was taking place at the time, monthly on a Friday evening. And I gave him this invitation, and he looked at it, and said, I can't come to this, I don't go to church. And I had to point out to him that it really didn't matter that we wanted him to come and to share our food. He then went on to tell me he had no intention of coming to church. Well, at least he was honest, but again, I was able to tell him it really didn't matter. And indeed, he did come, he came actually to a couple of barbecues uh, that I seem to remember. At one of those barbecues, I was talking to him and he said he was being moved on by social services to go and live uh, in social care in Bradford. And I lost touch with him. But several months later, just before Christmas, I happened to be in Bradford um, going to, to Waterstones to the bookshop. And who should I bump into but John on the steps of the, the, the Wool Exchange in Bradford where Waterstones is? And we had a little conversation. And I asked him what he was doing for Christmas. And this is the key to this story. He said that the church he was now going to was taking care of him at Christmas. He crossed the divide one way, but through this church reaching out to feed and to cross that social divide, we now have somebody who is going to church. I probably don't need to say more than that, but just ask the question, what does that teach us about feeding the hungry and crossing and teaching and working with those people that otherwise we may not have come into contact with? I'll leave you to ponder that. And so we have these three things that Boaz teaches us about supporting the weak, about being colourblind, about feeding the hungry. I still believe the Old Testament has something to teach us. The age-old truth, of course, that there's nothing new under the sun, is absolutely true. But it is now up to us to pick up and work with those things that the story of Boaz teaches in Ruth chapter 2, to build ourselves as individuals and collectively build us as a church. And we'll find more out about Boaz in week three of Bible Month, which is next Sunday. And so we come to our prayers of intercession. Now, rather than looking at me leading these prayers, I'm going to base those prayers on those three points that I picked up from Ruth chapter 2 that Boaz teaches us about being colourblind, about supporting the weak, and about feeding the hungry. You're going to see a picture. I want you to look at the picture, and as I offer the prayers, just think about what you can see and what it teaches us. And after we've had the prayers of intercession, we shall share together in the Lord's Prayer. And so we pray. And so we have the picture of the different coloured hands. All meeting together. As a symbol of colour blindness. So God and Father of all. In your love you made all the nations of the world to be a family. And your son taught us to love one another. And yet we realise our world is riven apart with prejudice and arrogance. So help us all as different races to understand one another better. Have sympathy with one another. To celebrate each other's culture. And live together with tolerance and goodwill so that we may appreciate all the gifts that all of us have, whatever our colour of skin. 
and help us to live together as members of one family in this your world. And so we look at the second preacher as we think about the weak and the vulnerable. And what could be more vulnerable than a tiny newborn baby who is so dependent on everybody else for care and support? So we think of all those in our society who are weak and vulnerable. The elderly, the disabled, those who do not fit in, those who find it difficult to speak out and make themselves heard, those who cry out for justice but find none. Those who do not get an equal share of all the things that the earth affords. We pray for this and every church as it reaches out to support these people. Give us the grace to know how to support these people. Give us the grace and the energy to reach out, to cross the social divides and help give the weak a voice. The final picture that we look at is a picture of a food kitchen serving food in the east end of London. Almighty God, it's difficult to see people struggling with hunger. And yet we know this day there are so many people who will not have food on their table. So Father God, we pray that you will provide the food that they need to, to live and to thrive. Pour out your grace on hungry families especially parents struggling to feed children despite dwindling resources. Teach us, as those who are fed, not to be complacent. And when we pray to you as part of the Lord's Prayer to give us our daily bread, make us realise that it's not just words that we are offering, but actually a plea for you to feed us. For we are totally reliant on your grace and bounty for the food that we have and enjoy. And so we bring all these prayers together as we share together in the Lord's Prayer. As we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to our final hymn. Uh, the words may well be new to you, but the tune won't. But the words take up the theme of uh, Ruth chapter 2, where we talk about the church reaching out. And so we sing together, Community of Christ.
And so before we conclude our service, just to mention that on Tuesday evening, there will be an online Bible study. We will be sending out the details of, of how to join it, but make sure that it's in your diary where we'll be looking at Ruth chapter 2, hopefully in a little bit more detail than we have been able to as part of this short service. And do join us again next Sunday when Chris will be taking us through Ruth chapter 3. And so we pray. Go in peace to live and to love, to show God's love and to receive God's love everywhere and at all times and the blessing of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore Amen